I now I call this meeting, meeting of the Danforth Community School, School District, District Board of Education to order. order. Can we Can all, we all stand, stand for the Pledge of Allegiance? Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and to the Republic for which it Thank, Thank you very, you very much. much. We will we move, move to board, board priorities, mission, mission and vision statement. statement. Director Potts, do you? Yeah. Do you want the Davenport School, School Board establishes, establishes the following priorities to ensure the ab academic, academic success, success of all students. students. Provide, Provide leadership and direction to improve the overall learning environment in our classrooms, classrooms schools, schools, and district, and district including, including the health, health safety, safety, security, and, security and happiness of students and staff. staff. Direct and support, and support actions, actions programs, programs, and activities which reduce the impacts of poverty on our students, their families, and our community. Thank you very Thank you much. much. Director, Director Gordon, Gordon, do you mind reading the mission and vision statement? Enhance students' abilities, abilities by providing, by providing quality, quality education enriched by our diverse, diverse community. community. That's the mission statement. statement. Vision, vision statement is education, education that challenges conventional, conventional thinking, thinking, prepares all students, students to compete in a global society, and inspires, and inspires our students, students parents, parents, staff, and community to answer the question, question what, if? what if? Thank, Thank you. you. Superintendent Snackcloth, do you mind reading us the goals? Goal number, Goal number two, two the, the continue, continue relationship building, building between, between the board and superintendent, superintendent in the areas, areas of trust, trust and communication. And communication. <laughs> okay, thank, thank you thank very you much, much for that. And, and just, just for the record, I want, I want you to know, know that, that President Gosa is with us, however, he's, he's on Zoom listening to us, us. So, so he'll be able, able to chime in as needed. Superintendent Snackcock, recognition. recognition. We, we have, have no recognitions, recognitions tonight, tonight, but we but do we have do a presentation. Have a presentation. Uh, we, have we have Shane Ford, Ford here, here with us. With she is, serves, many serves many roles, roles in the Davenport Community, Community School, School District, District, one of them one being out-of-school out time, time and out-of-school time, out of school time, school time opportunities. opportunities. And, and she heads, heads up a wonderful, a wonderful opportunity that some of our students get an opportunity to do. And it's visiting Wildwood Hills Ranch in Des Moines. And every year she works with Jenny Holupnik from 180 to help make sure that this happens. And so, Shane, I'll turn this over to you. You brought some friends with you today, which is fantastic. So, first of all, thank you guys for being here today. We're very, we're always excited to have students and parents come and sit with us. So just remember, this is just a conversation with us. All right, so don't be nervous. And let's just have a talk about, talk about what Wild World was like. And it looks like you even have some cheat sheet notes. Very, very prepared. prepared. So, so, so again, again, thank you for being here. And we're, we're looking forward to just having a conversation with you tonight. Shani, thank you. Thank you, TJ. So, so I have friends, friends here tonight, tonight uh, that, that came with me and we will start, start our presentation, presentation in a minute, in, a minute in, regard in regard to what that looks, that looks like, like. But I'm going to have them go down, down the line and introduce themselves. themselves. So you so just you push, push them down. Down. Mm -hmm. um, My name is Charlie Sampson and I go to Jefferson Elementary School.
So, so you got, you to, got hear to hear from, from two, two of the over 80 students, students that we've, that that we've sent, sent over the last, last two years. years. And, and I, think I think this continued, continued commitment, commitment and partnership, partnership with Camp Wildwood, Camp Wildwood is just going to grow every, every single, single year. year. We've been, we've been able, able to increase our slots every year, and it's our intention. Awesome. awesome. Cool, cool. Thank you. Thank you. Director, Director Gordon. Gordon. Is it Is just it kids from Davenport schools? schools? Do other, other schools, schools in the area send students as well? Do you guys stay in cabins with other kids? How does that all work? I'll answer part of it. So part of it is uh, neighboring schools send uh, students as well, and actually they all use JB. We meet here at JB Young, um, and Wildwood brings in the school buses to send all the kids. We send the largest number of students uh, within the two-state area, actually, Iowa and, and Illinois, to camp. No. Um, yes, we do, in fact, stay in cabins. There are girls' and boys' cabins. Um, there was, in fact, other people from my school there, so yeah, I did, in fact, stay in the cabin with some people that I knew. Any additional questions? Okay, thank you very much, Shani, for your presentation, and thank you all for coming and speaking to us, and we're glad you had a good time. Thank you so much for having us. No problem. Any board reports? Anyone have any board reports? President Gosa? President Gosar, are you there? there? He's, He's not, not responding, responding at all, at all but, but I do know, know that. I, I can know. hear you now. I couldn't hear none of the presentation, so I don't have any any questions or anything. But thank you, Shaney, for all your hard work and everything you do for the district. She's exited, exited the building. building. <laughs> oh, okay. Thank you. Thank you. you have do any have board any reports? reports? Done at this time. Thank you. Well, well one, one um, um, board, board report, report that, that I have, and I, I know President, President Gosa participated, participated in well, well as well, well on, Friday, on Friday. There was, there was a, Zoom a Zoom call from, from uh, um, the topic was racism. racism. The topic was racism. Was racism. And um, um, it, it, it was, was a nice, nice presentation. presentation. I, I didn't, didn't get everything out of it that I was looking, looking forward, forward to, to, but for the for most part, part, it was racism, racism in, the in the school buildings and different, different forms of racism, racism and different, different things, things that we that can we do, do to kind of get it out and open. I guess, I guess the, the message, message that, that I left with, with is, is if it's on your mind, bring it up and talk to the person about it. So it was pretty good. Now we'll now move, move right, right on, on to, to open, open forum. forum. Open, open forum, forum is, is a time, time for members of the community to give input at a board meeting regarding school district issues and concerns. 
Individuals who want to speak, please fill out an open forum request and give it to the board secretary prior to open forum. The form is available in hard copy and in person attendees or on the school board page of the district website. For those who want to participate virtually, virtual participants must email their request to Brenda T at tbrand at davenportschools.org by 3 p.m. on the day of the board meeting. The board will not act on any issue presented during open forum if it's not published as an agenda item. Iowa Open Meetings Law prohibits actions on any issue that is not on the agenda. The president will set forth the amount of time allowed for individuals to speak. The board asks that no charges or complaints be made against individual employees of the district or community. Remarks that reflect negatively on the character or motives of any person will be called out of order. To participate virtually, call 1312-626-6799 and enter the meeting ID 923-4103. 7778 with the passcode of 56821. I do have two open forums and we'll each give be given two minutes. If you could, when you approach the podium, please give your name and your address. I have Jamie Cook and Jacqueline Cook. Okay, either one of you. Can you hear me now? <laughs> All right. It's Jacqueline Cook, 1162 410th Avenue. Um, I'm here about the, I think it was a halo monitoring system. I, I think that's the name of it. Um, Miss Beck had said something. She had raised some concerns about privacy uh, with the use of keywords. I share those concerns. Um, it was said that the alerted staff will not receive any recordings, but that doesn't mean that it's not that it's not recording. That you know, it just means that the person receiving the alert isn't getting the recordings. Um, if the system can be alerted by using keywords, that tells me it's listening in all the time. And to me, that's a huge invasion of privacy in what should be the most private room of any building. I agree with Mr. Gosa. Uh, we don't want students hanging out in the bathroom, but if you ask any female here, almost all of them will tell you they have sought the privacy of the bathroom to work through or help someone work through social or emotional difficulties. If that privacy is removed, the opportunity for collaborative problem solving and a coping mechanism will be stolen. Another concern with the use of keywords is playful banter resulting in disciplinary action. It was stated uh, that this system can uh, differ or wait, different, I'm sorry. It can tell, it, it can tell the context, decipher context, oh my goodness. Um, but we can assume that's solely linguistic context. Uh, we've all heard the saying that 90% of communication is nonverbal. Well, I saw a study and it said that 7% of communication is words. That's it, only 7%. So that tells me that the use of keywords in linguistic context uh, would, be, would be hypersensitive and inaccurate. But I do have a few questions. Um, one of them is what information is stored in the cloud storage? If these things are recorded and, and what have you, will that, be, will that be stored there? How long will that information be saved? Who can access stored information within the district and third party? If solely using the decimal system and no language monitoring, uh, will that reduce the amount of storage required, thus reducing the cost? And the proposal was only for a portion of the bathrooms at more than $50,000. What would the additional cost be to include all restrooms? And uh, what is the increase in the biannual cost? Thank you. Do what? Oh, sure. Thank you. Mr. Cook. All right, Jamie Cook, 11624 110th Avenue, Davenport, Iowa. Uh, I requested an additional 
minute, 30 seconds if I could just to flesh everything out. Is that okay? Okay, thank you. Uh, I know some of y'all have been educators for a long time. I guarantee you're probably familiar with this book, The Giver. I was actually the last class when I went to school in sixth grade before this was taken off of the policy or whatever and put on the banned book list. It was banned in 1990 all the way up until 19, uh, 2009. First subject covering emphasized in euthanasia. However, when put into context of the dystopian society, the novel outlines, it describes a world where everyone is equal, safe, and happy, or so they think. Everyone has exactly the same as everyone else and have productive roles in their society. Those that are useful but unpersonable are isolated to night jobs during curfew when most other citizens, for most other citizens. Those that are not or will never be or are no longer useful to society are released. The reader soon finds out the through following the main character, Jonah, uh, is the society is full of monitoring and control and repression. It slowly fresh fleshes out that the one man, the giver, is the only member that remembers the life before, the beauty, the joy, the reward, and the ugly of the real world. And with that is given special privileges. The plot finally unfolds in their world. Equality is actually equity. Safety is actually enslavement. Happiness is ignorance. And the giver is the 1% that gets to live his life in real freedom. And what's this really come down to? I understand that the, the vandalism needs to stop and safety is of, a, of the utmost importance. However, the halo system is as presented outside of fights and vaping. The key word feature that supposedly lacks audio recording, I see quickly turning into white noise. The productive citizen portion, I agree, is the goal of raising the next generation and the responsibility as society as a whole. However, your role as the community school district is education, math, reading, language arts, economics, history, grading tests, assignments turned in on time, etc. It is the parents, friends, families, neighbors' job to ensure that our children fit into society, not the schools, not the teachers unions, not stakeholders. So yes, I am very concerned when a member of the policy committee is so reluctant to ensure the highest quality education environment, especially when they, the very thing, that very thing was denied to some of our students that questioned the district's authority last year, but instead is more focused on molding them into productive citizens not through history, science, social studies, but through bringing in stakeholders so they can, quote, express what, the, sorry, unquote, basically so that they can express what the stakeholders see as a productive citizen. I have a problem with that. I really think that's what's causing a vast majority of our problems in society. That's all I got. Thank you very much for your comments, Mr. Cook. May I have a motion for the consent agenda? Madam Vice President, Director Beck. I move the board approve the consent agenda as presented. Second. Second. Been moved by Director Beck and second by Director Gordon. Is there any discussion? 
call for the vote. Director Beck? Yes. Director Gordon? Yes. President Gosa? Yes. Director Klein Drone? Yes. Director Poston? Yes. Director Pot? Yes. My vote is yes. Motion passed. May I have a motion for the approval of bills? Madam Chairwoman. Director Boston. Move the board approve the following resolution. Resolved all claims presented to the board having been duly certified as correct by the treasurer, reviewed by the administration and board members, and they are hereby audited and allowed as just claims and warrants drawn on the treasury for several amounts. Further resolve the payment of claims and salaries be approved as presented for the periods of July 20, 20 2022 to August 2nd, 2022, noting voided, voided check number 379915, wrong vendor. May I have a second? Second. And moved by Director Poston, second by Director Klein Jerome. Is there any discussion? Seeing as none, I'll call for the vote. Director Poston? Yes. Director Klein Jerome? Yes. Director Beck? Yes. President Gosa? President Gosa? Yes. Director Potts? Yes. Director Gordon? Yes. And my vote is yes. Motion passed. Superintendent's report? None at this time. Committee reports. Superintendent Snackoff, could you do the data wall report? Yes, we <clears throat> we met and we reviewed where what cut types of additions to this to the boardroom would the data wall team uh, recommend and we're bringing that forward uh, to the school board and some of the upcoming meetings this space can definitely be enhanced we host a half of our district in here at a time uh, with our leaders and our teachers to do professional development so the added visual space would be a, a beneficial part for that and so also our cabinet is working on the data points that we can highlight and the plan would be to utilize those screens to either project additional spaces or additional spots for us to see but also to put focus areas up there but also to utilize um, pictures visualizations to share um, celebrations of those data points as well so some really good conversations coming from the data wall committee finance committee we have our, our monthly meeting next next week. Legislative advocacy. Legislative advocacy. So we we met. We've worked on our priorities. Those priorities are coming forward. Um, we're also beginning to plan out when we're going to visit our local city. Um, city council meetings and we're adding again the um, board of supervisors to that we're also beginning to plan the meet our our meet and greets with our legislators to share our priorities we also over the course of last week during sai we met uh, the uen met with um, the uen leaders and began to discuss strategy coming into the upcoming session thank you for that long range planning we met last Friday. Uh, we reviewed the first draft of the community survey. Um, and as you received an email on the 29th from Josh, it laid out the, what that survey is looking like. It also laid out the timeline that we're looking at for rolling out more information on our long range facility plan. We have our two public meetings coming up. One is the 11th, which is this Thursday. Thank you for that policy committee. Um, we have uh, our uh, mission and vision statement uh, on the agenda for tonight. 
And then a uh, regular monthly meeting is on Wednesday of this week. Director Beck, can you also do LCAC? I'm sorry. LCAC? LCAC, oh, out there in hiatus, please. Okay, thank you. Now we move to action items. May I have a motion on item number 10.01, Recover Health and Iowa Nursing Contract? Madam Vice President. Director Beck. I move the board approve the contract with Recover Health of Iowa for the fiscal year 2022-23 at $59.64 as an hourly rate to be billed monthly in order to provide nursing services that are outlined in a student's IEP. Thank you. May I have a second? Then moved by Director Beck and second by Director Potts. Is there any discussion? Seeing as none, I call for the vote. Director Beck? Yes. Director Potts? Yes. President Gosa? Yes. Director Klein Jerome? Yes. Director Poston? Yes. Director Gordon, are you in a position that you can vote on item number 10.01, Recovery Health and Iowa Nursing Contract? Yes, my vote is yes. Your vote? Thank you. And mine's is yes as well. Motion passed. Moving on to item number 10.02, Unity Point at Home nursing contract student one may I have a motion mr president <laughs> director potts i move the board approve the contract with unity point at home nursing for the physical year 2022-23 at 60 dollars as an hourly rate to be billed monthly in order to provide nursing services that are outlined in the students individual educational program thank you very much may i have a second second it's been properly moved by Director Potts and second by Director Klein Jerome. Any discussion? Seeing as none, I'll call for the vote. Director Potts? Yes. Director Klein Jerome? Yes. Director Beck? Yeah. <coughs> yes. President Gosa? Yes. Director Poston? Yes. Director Gordon? Yes. And my vote is yes. Motion passed. Moving on to item 10.03, Uni Point at Home Nursing Contract for student number two. May I have a motion? Madam President. Director Pop? I move that the board approve the contract with Unity Point at Home Nursing for the physical year 2022-2023 at $60 as an hourly rate to be billed monthly in order to provide nursing services that are outlined in Student Two's individual educational program. I have a second. Second. It's been properly moved by Director Potts and second by Director Klein Jerome. Is there any discussion? Seeing as none, I'll call for the vote. Director Potts? Yes. Director klein -Trong? Yes. Director Beck? Yes. President Gosa? Yes. Director Poston? Yes. Director Gordon? Yes. My vote is yes. Motion passed. Moving on to 10.04. Michelle's vocational placement contract. May I have a motion? Madam Chairwoman. Director Gordon. I move that the board approve the contract with Michelle's vocational placement LLC MVP for the fiscal year 2022-2023 for $43,103.50 in order to pro provide job development and coaching that supports our students within Project Search. Thank you very much. May I have a second? Second. Second. Director Potts. It's been properly moved and second. Director Gordon made the motion. Director Potts second it. Is there any discussion? Call for the vote. Director Gordon? Yes. Director Potts? Yes. 
Director Beck? Yes. President Golsa? Yes. Director Klein Jerome? Yes. Director Poshkin? Yes. My vote is yes. Motion passes. Moving on to item 10.05, building automotive upgrade. Madam Chairwoman. Director Poshkin? Move the board approve the contracts for the train controls upgrades for Central High, North High, and West High schools for $793,391. Thank you very much. May I get a second? Second. It's been properly moved by Director Poston and second by Director Klein Jerome. Is there any discussion? Seeing as none, we'll call for the vote. Director Poston? Yes. Director Klein Jerome? Yes. Director Beck? Yes. President Golsa? Yes. Director Potts? Yes. Director Gordon? Yes. And my vote is yes. Motion passes. Item number 10.06, ISB, IASB legislative priorities. May I have a motion? Madam President, Director Vice President. Beck. I move the board submit the following legislative priorities to the Iowa Association of School Boards, supplemental state aid, early literacy, and I believe we have to make a decision on the other two. Oh, okay. I am going to say teacher recruitment and licensure and school funding policy. Those are the next two in the list. I have a second. It's been moved by Director Beck, second by Director Potts. Is there any discussion? President, um, I would like to change the teacher recruitment and licensure to the preschool. I'm sorry? I would like to withdraw the teacher recruitment and licensure and instead substitute preschool in there. So we would continue with school funding policy, but then we had three that were in a tie on this. I would like to see it be school funding policy and preschool. That's number four, okay, teacher recruitment and preschool. Is there any discussion on that? Director Gordon? I understand the importance of preschool as a priority. However, if we don't have teachers, then we can't have preschool. Wait. You? I understand the necessity of preschool as a priority. However, if we don't have enough teachers, then we can't have preschools. We can't have enough classrooms and, and serve everyone that needs served if we don't have the teachers. So I think we should keep teacher recruitment and licensure in the top four. Director Beck? Um, this is basically um, just the legislative priorities, what we want them to advocate for for next year, right? Correct. Um, Okay, I'll come back to the rest of my thought. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any additional discussion? Um, state aid, early literacy. Um, a concern I have with the preschool and not being a priority is the funding is kind of backwards and so we're not forward funding our preschools. Um, I think that's where we need to get a focus. We need to get our preschools funded, get staff, get students, instead of waiting for the students to come and then we get the funding after the fact. I still think that the preschools should be a big priority.
President Gosa, did you have anything to add? Um, I, I can see both sides of that. Um, I'm a little, I'm trying to figure out, uh, Director Klein Jerome, did she make a motion to amend it to add or to substitute that? Or are you just pulling the board right now to see where they're at with that? I threw it out there as a discussion, but okay. I can make um, it. Okay. Well, thank you for clarifying that. I, I, I see both sides of it. Obviously, yeah, we have to have the teachers there. It's like uh, if we have if we focus on the preschool part of it, because um, everything is early literacy and things like that. And we've been um, touting on that for a while and and doing a lot of things towards that. So I, I see that point of it. And at the same time, I see the point that you know we have to have teachers able to. Uh, to teach and things like that. And I, if I'm not mistaken, I think the, uh, the teacher recruitment stuff is that, um, and don't quote me wrong, but is that like lowering the standards of what it entails to become a teacher so that more people are eligible for it? Director Beck. So I pulled up what the IASB had as their legislative resolutions. So these are their explanations behind what they would lobby for under each of these categories. Um, the one for preschool simply says supports continued funding to ensure that all four and five year olds have access to the statewide voluntary preschool program, supports an increase in funding from the current weighting um, of 0.5 to 1.0 full-time equivalent uh, to increase the ability of districts to provide services such as full-day programming and transportation. And then districts should be given maximum f flexibility to assign costs to the program. The teacher recruitment and licensure one, actually, that was my concern as well, Director Gosa, but the IASB says specifically supports additional tools to attract individuals to the teaching profession and their bullet points are alternative teacher licensure upon completion of research based teaching pedagogy training in addition to content knowledge in a curricular area pathways for individuals with non-traditional or international educational backgrounds to meet licensure qualifications reciprocity agreements with other states with high quality education programs to increase diversity amongst our certified teachers and administrators Expansion of programs such as Teach Iowa Scholar, Troops to Teachers, Teacher Intern Program. Um, programs designed to recruit and retain teachers that will better match the demographic makeup of our student population and advocate for funding of loan forgiveness programs, grants, and stipends that will make education careers more attractive and affordable option. So the way I read that, their advocacy is not for lowering standards, but for um, allowing more uh, uh, alternatives such as licensing, automatic licensing of pe people with <clears throat> licenses in other states, a bigger pool, um, as Director Potts said. And the preschool one, as I interpret it, to get at Director Klein-Jerome's point, seems like they are not even going to be talking about when funding occurs that's not sort of on their radar right now. So with that, I would support the teacher licensure one. I don't want to support lowering the standards, but it sounds like IASB does not want that either. So that's my personal opinion. Director Poston. If you, if you look on the list, uh, the priorities from last year, dropout at risk, mental health, teacher recruitment, school funding, supplemental aid. Um, you know, I don't. I don't agree with all of those. Um, if if you've got a good preschool program and you're working hard on early literacy, then there's some things that hopefully will go away, which would be dropout at risk, mental health. Um, so I would uh, I would move that uh, we adopt 
the legislative platform of preschool, early literacy, school funding, and teacher recruitment. I will make that as an amendment. I'll second that amendment. Preschool, early literacy, school funding, and teacher recruitment. Dan seconded. Director Vick made the motion. Are you okay with the amendment? Um, I actually think that supplemental state aid is a huge issue right now because it's not keeping up with um, inflation. And I don't feel like we've been seeing a lot of uh, uh, movement with that, but the school foundation formula is also important. We have seen a little bit of movement with that. So I guess I would defer to somebody who knows a little bit more about how legislative advocacy works. If we've seen a little bit of movement in the school funding policy, is it worth making that more of a priority than supplemental state aid? I don't know. Superintendent Snekla. As you're selecting these priorities, every other UEN in the state's gonna select that one. Um, or ISB, supplemental state aid. It'll be at the top of everyone's list. I think it goes without being said that ISB is going to push for a higher supplemental state aid. Um, so if you did choose to take that one off there, you will know it will be advocated for. They, they are constantly pushing for that. They're constantly pushing for the, um, the additional $5, $10 every year, the transportation formula. Um, just, I think we just need to contemplate what that means if we take it off of ours. Um, and if you're comfortable with that, I think the four that the, the ones that are on the floor currently are very, um, are very, very important, um, incredibly important. Teacher retention is is extremely important. And look what happened last year when we asked our state to focus on it. We now have that teacher. The, uh, they put a task force together and we now. We're the recipients of a $3.7 million grant that we're growing our own teachers. And guess what? Those teachers look like the students in our classrooms too that we're, that we're entering into this agreement. So that's very powerful. The notion that our four-year-olds uh, funding could be pushed forward to 1.0, because that's what that says, that, that it would be fully funded is incredibly powerful as well. So those, th that would be my take on the supplemental state aid piece. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for that explanation. Director Poston, what was your fourth one? I'm sorry, preschool, early literacy, school funding, and... Preschool, early literacy, school funding, and teacher recruitment. And just, just to follow up with what uh, TJ said, too, that, I mean, on the supplemental state aid, you know, we'll be up in Des Moines again lobbying with the legislators and I think that's where you have more effect as far as approaching the supplemental state aid when you're there one on one with the legislators that's when you're going to make a difference director Potts so if I hear correctly are not putting it on there is not going to change the course of the priorities of the Iowa School Board Association correct I'm shocked <laughs> correct <laughs> It prob I'm, I'm a guessing man that it probably will be the focus of everyone else. Madam President, I call the previous question. I call the question. Okay. And that is? That means we go to the vote. Okay. That means no more changes. <laughs> no more changes. So now... The So now the new motion on the table is to change the priorities to preschool, early literacy, school funding, and teacher recruitment. The motion was made by Director Poston, seconded by President Gosa. We'll call for the vote. Director Poston? Yes. President Gosa? Yes. Director Beck? Yes. 
Director Klein Jerome? Yes. Director Potts? Yes. Director Gordon? Yes. And my vote is yes. Motion passed with the amendments that were made. Item number 10.02, RSAI legislation priorities. May I have a motion? Madam Vice President. Director Beck. I move the legislative priorities for rural school advocates of Iowa be submitted as presented. Second. Properly moved by Director Beck and second by Director Poston. Is there any discussion? We'll call for the vote. Director Beck? Yes. Director Poston? Yes. President Gosa? Yes. Director Kleintron? Yes. Director Potts? Yes. Director Gordon? Yes. My vote is yes. Motion passed. Item number 10.08, UEN legislative priorities. May I have a motion? Madam Vice President. Director Beck. I move the legislative priorities for Urban Education Network be submitted as presented. A second. Second. Well, that was a tie, but I think Director Potts was probably louder. Is there any discussion? Call for the vote, Director Beck. Yes. Director Potts? Yes. President Gosa? Yes. Director Kleindrome? Yes. Director Poston? Yes. Director Gordon? Yes. And my, my vote is yes. Item number 10.09. Madam Chairwoman. Director Poston? Move the board approve the proposal from Tri City Electric to purchase 22 Halo Smart Sensor 2C Health Safety and Vape devices in the amount of $51,358.38. I have a second. Second. Been properly moved by Director Poston, second by Director Potts. Any discussion? Director Beck? Um, I actually um, had wanted to uh, reiterate or iterate some of the questions that we heard tonight. Um, if we could get answers on those, that would be very helpful. I don't know if there's been time to do that in the last little bit, but specifically, um, how much would it cost to cover all the bathrooms at once? I do realize why we're rolling out the the few at a time to make sure they work um and then uh the other question about uh what information is stored and how long and where and who has access to that so i might be able to answer some of that i believe the the stored information is location time date what the trigger was um, it can be stored for up to a year um, as far as who would have access to that, um, it, it would probably be Andy Nyrink, myself, somebody related to the security team or an administrator that would have, you know, a need for that information. I can't answer the cost. I know at one time we talked about the cost for the entire, all the high schools. Um, I just didn't find it yet. Do you recall, Andy? I don't recall the specific number in it. it, 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 it. I don't recall what the specific number to do all the bathrooms in the high school is. One of the things that's going to affect that is it's it's a set cost per sensor, but it's how far you have to run wire. So it's going to affect some would be more, some would be less. But we can get those numbers. Um, and And... The, the cost one, um, 
I, I, I'm fine waiting on that. Um, but I do still have some concerns um, about the privacy issue uh, using, you know, keywords. I mean, I think about it with my Google Home device. I know it's listening all the time and it does bother me a little bit. Um, so I guess I wonder about the feasibility of perhaps doing a soft entry and using, you know, not using that part of the system and just the, the chemical sensors or, you know, what measures we have in place for maintaining the privacy of our students. Um, again, that may be something that can't be answered right now. So. I mean, that's the nice part about the system is it is adjustable. We weren't, I mean, we're not going into this with like a set priority of things we need, exactly need to do, but um, I think we're kind of going about it with a soft start, not in every bathroom, not in every school. I mean, um, to see how it works. Okay. Okay. If, if it feels like it's triggering all the time off of words that people talk about or just normally in conversation, I don't think we want to be chasing all of those down either. So, um, okay. it, it's something we're going to have to evaluate as time goes on. Okay. And then my other question came up last week. Um, I know there's an app that the people who have access to this information can have, and I guess I worry, wonder about the privacy of that and how many people would be able to have that app that would notify when there's an issue, right? So I would assume, <laughs> Mr. Nyrink, obviously, and you, um, but you know, every teacher in the school doesn't need that app. So I guess, have, do we have a plan in place for limiting that information and making sure that, you know, it's not just everybody that has access to that. My understanding last week that we talked about it was only the security people and the principal in the building. It is not teachers at all is what correct. we brought up last week. Perfect. That is correct. Director Parson. <clears throat> do you do you want these installed by the start of school year? That's it, it would be nice, but I don't think it's gonna happen anymore. But Ideally, that would have been so. The sooner we get on it, the the better. Then correct. Okay. Well, I, I I understand what some of the concerns are on the privacy and everything, but I am totally fed up with having our bathrooms tore up. And the next time a bathroom gets tore up in a school building, my first recommendation is going to be that we're going to put porta potties in those hallways, and they can use porta potties if they want to tear up our bathrooms. Because this is ridiculous. There's no way we should be putting up with that. It's good enough for the Bix. <laughs> Director Gordon. I have two questions. Um, the first one is, um, is there a way for it to monitor just volume, like decibels and not keywords, so that, you know, fights and vandalism both are going to be a lot louder than people just conversationally speaking about who's so-and-so wants to fight, you know what I mean? Or um, other trigger things like that. Volume, I think, is going to be more important. Is that something that's possible? I believe volume plays a factor in that because if I walked in there and dropped this bottle of water, I don't think it would trigger an alarm. But if I slam my hand down on this desk really loud, it would trigger the alarm. Right. One um, of the things that I really liked from the presentation about this is you could just make it say one keyword help. So if you're in the bathroom and something's bad is happening, you can make that keyword help. So that's the only word it picks up. And you can tell all the kids, if you're in the bathroom and something's happening, yell help. Okay. So, and it, yes, it can be shut up just to the decibel levels. So we, we actually, when we watched the demonstration of this, it was actually sitting in the floor and we, we got an opportunity to make noise around it. And um, Josh volunteered to vape around it, but we, we chose not to. <laughs> Just kidding, Josh. So, it, yes, it all of those things, those features can be shut off. And if that's feedback that the board would like to start with, just 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 loudness of it and, and maybe piloting one key word to 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 um, kind of accommodate the fears that people are having that their privacy is being infringed on. But some of the stories that we see in here coming out of our bathroom, this isn't about picking up on people's conversations. It's about, you know, being helped in a time of need. And that's the way we, we could set that up and approach it that way. So if we if, if this is something that we, we want to start with volume and 
and sensory, I think we absolutely can do that. So the great I, questions. I had one other question. So if there's an app that is going to be on, I assume phones, is that so our school security personnel going to be expected to download an app that they have to use for work on their personal phones? Is administration in the buildings expected to do that? How does that work? What does that look like? I believe so, it would be. So inside of our district, the, we, we have it set up to where it can go to computers. If people so choose to put that on their phone, if they have access, we have good practice in this right now. Um, because we have the P3 app inside of our district. And so we, we, have, we have an opportunity to practice that. And so that can come solely to administration who can respond immediately. Um, and I, I believe our same protocols would follow for P3 um, as, as it would for this. So it would be a security tip that would go directly to our officers. Isn't it just a notification that's coming? It's not a printout saying, the following words were said, but rather it's a notification of a concern there. And I, I think that's part of what people were getting concerned about who will see this. It's more of the, the notification that we get that something has happened in a location. So that's what's going to send folks to that, not that location, not a printout of our transcript of what is going on around. I would support the word help being put in there because anybody in there, if there's something going on and they can say that and somebody get there, I think that is worthwhile. Did you have anything to add, President Gossel? Yes. Did you get an answer for me on when they set this up, they can do junction boxes while they're running the lines? So if we want to add something later, it's less of a cost. Yes, they can do that for sure. Is that included in this price? I believe it is, but I think it all depends on where they're coming from. But I, I yes, it's included in the price. Because if we do it, I would rather just have that pre-done ahead of time because they're already running the wires. So it's very easy to add other uh, units to it than pull more wire. I agree. That was all I had. Any additional discussion? Okay, we'll call for the vote. Director Posse? Yes. Director Potts? Yes. Director Beck? Yes. President Gosa? Yes. Director Klein Jerome? Yes. Director Gordon? Yes. And my vote is yes. Motion passed. Item number 10.10. .10. Director Beck? Um, <clears throat> Um, and I move that the board approve the following policies, 203-213-503.04. Second. Is there any discussion? Seeing as none, we'll call for the vote. Director Beck? Yes. Director Potts? Yes. President Gosa? President Gosa? Yes. Director Klein Jerome? Yes. Director Poston? Yes. Director Gordon? Yes. And my vote is yes. Motion passed. Item number, we'll jump down to the discussion item for. 11.01 .01 and then come back up and vote for 10.11 after the discussion. Is that okay? Okay. Discussion item 11.01. Okay. So um, <clears throat> the uh, 
superintendent and board members worked with uh, TAG to develop a new mission statement, and we discussed it uh, last week. So our newest or final draft is uh, listed before you. Along with that, TAG uh, used all of our input to come up with three guiding principles. And so um, the idea is that we will adopt the new mission statement along with these guiding principles, and then in uh, figure out what to do about policy 100, which is the district philosophy that typically includes the mission statement and a vision statement. Um, so basically the idea here with this discussion part is to see if there's anything else that people have questions or concerns about regarding the mission statement and the guiding principles. And then, if not, how to go about with um, revising policy 100 so that it is both legally compliant and it fits, um, it's, it's much more readable and uh, expands this into sort of the, the vision part of how the district is going to accomplish the mission statement. Okay, item 11.01, .01, open for discussion. Mm -hmm. So I'd entertain any comments on the mission statement and guiding principles as they've been presented to us. And then if not, I'd like to hear um, some thoughts about how to go about uh, adjusting policy 100, which is the district philosophy so that it is matches what we're doing. Director Klinger. Um, not to push this back on tag, but you did a really good job on our mission statement. Um, and you know what all of our input was. So perhaps you could look at the district philosophy and wordsmith in what you've already, I mean, we've already sat in on a workshop coming up with these ideas. Um, might be a great way to take some of our ideas, look at this. Thank you. Is everyone in agreement with that? So my question then is, we had talked as a policy committee about the bullet pointed statements, um, the model we saw in some other districts, which was um, some districts had like belief statements, right, instead of a wordy philosophy like this that had the mission, the vision or guiding principles, and then a number of statements like, we believe that all students can succeed, we believe that, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, others were uh, uh, expectations for what students should be able to do when they graduate from our district. Um, you know, students should be uh, I don't know, I can't think of one right off the top of my head, but um, um, for what we want our students to be able to do when they're when we award that diploma. So I guess I would ask if that would be a better model for district philosophy than something sort of written out in prose like this, and I'd ask for feedback on that. Um, go ahead, Director Postion. Well, I think the, uh, the philosophy that's there now is just way too wordy. I, I like <clears throat> what the new mission statement guiding principles lays out, and I, I think it does a good summary of what the, the what f philosophy is. So I don't know if we need much more than just the mission statement and the guiding principles. But I would be in favor of, of uh, TAG taking a look at it and uh, seeing if there's some things that we need to insert there. <laughs> Director Potts is saying, okay, and and what Kent said, uh, Director Gordon. I agree with what Kent said. I don't have any additional. I agree with what Kent said. I don't have any additional feedback right this minute. Uh, Director Gosa. 
I don't have any additional feedback either. Director Hayes. As long as Mike is in agreement with taking it and maybe works making it, I'm okay with it. Okay, sounds like it's okay. He's nodding. Okay. Um, so then uh, <clears throat> we, so what I'm hearing just to confirm is we will adopt the mission and guiding principles as written, and those will then henceforth be our new mission statement and guiding principles. And then the policy committee, I'm guessing, can work with TAG to format some of our other workshop information into um, a philosophy statement if that seems appropriate. I think they have to work with the policy committee. And just bring it to us. Yeah. Okay fine with me all right it's fine with tag okay <laughs> i figured i should probably ask <laughs> all right okay so going back to item 10.11 it would just be the mission statement and we will approve the guiding principles at a later date once we get that information back so if somebody would like to make that a motion madam president Director Potts. I move the board approve the mission statement and guiding principles as presented. The wording will be incorporated into policy 100 when the district philosophy is reviewed and or revised. Second. Thank you. It's been properly moved and second. Is there any additional discussion to the motion? Seeing as none, we'll call for the vote. Director Potts. Yes. Director klein -Jerome? Yes. Director Beck? Yes. President Gosa? Yes. Director Poston? Yes. Director klein -Jerome? Or I'm sorry, Director Gordon? Yes. And my vote is yes. Motion passed. Moving to item... 11.02, Superintendent Snekha. As stated in previous uh, board reports, um, we believe it's time to move forward with the district to hire uh, Bray Architects to begin to look at adding a practice gym and a weight room and a wrestling room onto the property. The need for this has been there for many years. It's been pushed back. Um, this does take into the effect that to the, the, the this does take into the effect that we are currently partnered with the YMCA and that contract runs out 2029 and this allows us the flexibility and freedom to keep that partnership and also give the appropriate amount of practice space for our students at West High School. At West High School, also the gym, uh, the weight room, and the wrestling room are in the base, currently located in the basement of the high school, and have been since the since the start of that school. Um, our students, the way that our, the way that our activities are shaping up, and even during the day for for PE classes, um, that a lot of them are running through the BIP, through our programming through the weight room, and and their students at West are, are in desperate need of this. And so right now we'd entertain any questions. Obviously this is just the start, the start of the projects to allow us to start working with Bray. Josh, do you have anything to add to that? No, I just wanted to emphasize that besides practice, it's utilized throughout the day for PE and programming for this, the school day as well. Um, the fee of 6% for uh, architectural services is pretty common. Um, uh, it's, it's a common fee for these types of things. So. Um, I've done some research, looked around the area, found other projects similar to this that um, this falls right in line with the area. Would we repurpose? Karen's question was, would we repurpose the dungeon in the basement? And I can easily see that be utilized as storage. Okay. Um, like we're not putting people back down there. Okay. No. Good. I think Willie said he'd like to have his office down there. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
Sorry, Dan. We would look to make that more of a storage area. Director Carson. <clears throat> well, first I wanna uh, preface my comments by, by saying that um, this is sorely needed at West. Uh, it, it'll enable it to be on the same level as what we have at North and Central. Um, but I do have some concerns um again i have a problem with with our arrangement with the why um again uh, tj you can correct me if i'm wrong but all of that building was was paid by um uh, our taxpayers uh there was no money put into that from uh the why um to me it looks like this is a cash cow uh, for the Y. Um, they're also supposed to be taking care of um, maintenance. And from what I'm hearing, that's not happening. A lot of the um, rims and baskets and everything are in, in poor repair. And that was supposed to be the, uh, was supposed to be taken care of by the Y. So, when I look at this, so you, you look at $11 million project um, or you look at just taking over what's there now and then building the weight room and building um, the wrestling room, I think could be done for a lot less money. Now, it, <clears throat> the argument could be that uh, the why is there to help serve the community. And that's, and I'm, you know, I'm not going to argue that. Um, but I just feel that the arrangement we have, both at West and at North, is not in the best interest of Davenport schools. And I think we need to take a look at, can we, can we make better use of our taxpayers' dollars and um, look at how the Y is still involved uh, you know, with, with the building? Director Beck. Oh, along those lines, I guess I'm wondering what the history of, of the partnership with the Y is, because I didn't know the, I don't know what the financial arrangement is, because if it is something that we as a district put money into, but the Y didn't, I'm wondering if yeah, it's, I'm wondering what our options are for using the space that's already built rather than building new space, right? Um, but I don't know what the partnership is and how it's set up and and what benefits we get from it versus that. So I guess I'd be interested to know a little bit more about the history of that relationship and how it works now. Well, if you look at the current setup at North, North was added to because of the current situation. So there's one gymnasium at Davenport North and a two gym um, competition gym was added to there. So the, the issues that they have in terms of their membership with the Y are not the same. So the big benefit from North is the pool. So they, in, in dealing with um, the sharing of those facilities, they have worked that out. At Davenport West, it's slightly different. So there's, there are two full gyms at Davenport at the West Y. What is needed is all the West YMCA to run just like the North YMCA to serve the community like Kent was talking about. There's an additional gym is needed. That will provide Davenport schools with the exact, or Davenport West with the exact same thing that is currently seated at North. Um, I would say maybe a slightly different because North's competition gym is the the two gymnasium and they're i call it the old line the old you know wildcat den the the smaller gym is still in service so this if and and in, i believe our contract is up in 2029 I, I believe it is and and the ymca currently serves 3500 people um out of the that ymca i would say the relationship between those at at west and at that ymca have been strange for that reason both programs need those gym, those gymnasiums to work so 
And, and I would say if the YMCA partnership wasn't there, I would still say that this would be the need of Davenport West High School. So they would have three practice, gym, practice and I'll say PE gymnasiums. Their weight room, is, uh, weight room and wrestling room would be out of the basement. Um, I am going to dig into the exact things that Kent has written down um, just to ensure that both sides are meeting and following the contract as, as stipulated because we want to make sure that we're maximizing, just like uh, uh, Director Potion was saying, maximizing that relationship and getting everything out of it that we said. When that, when that relationship started, the pool was shared and those gym spaces were shared. We're currently not sharing the pool with the Y. Um, the, the gym sharing has been, I would say, um, a, a tumultuous topic. And it is now to the point where if there is a disagreement between the two entities, it will it's sit written into the contract that it will be solved by the superintendent and the CEO of the YMCA. So right now, um, <clears throat> that's where that relationship stands, and that's why we feel this is the most this is the best way to move forward. Any additional discussion, Director Boston? Uh, just just another point too if <clears throat> i was told that a lot of the the membership is actually west eye students so again the school district put up the building um it's being poorly maintained <clears throat> why do our students at west high have to pay a y membership i mean this is a school district building um and to me, it, it just is, is not a good arrangement. Did you have anything more to add, President Gosa? Um, actually, uh, Director Pasha kind of hit on what I was going to say. I, I don't know how the whole thing uh, came about. I think it's weird that North and West had to partner with the Y to get pools, but Central didn't. But I do also think that it is a disservice that our students have to get memberships to go to those Ys because it's the same way at North and a Y membership. It, it was cheaper for me to get my kid a membership at a gym than to go to the Y right by his school that he could literally walk out of school and go to. So, um, I, again, I don't want to be in breach of contract or nothing. I, I believe the way it's worded, the superintendent has to bring those concerns. So um, I don't really want to publicly throw that out there, but uh, definitely I think there are some things that need to be addressed. But as far as the facility and everything, the item that we're discussing, I think that's a huge thing. Uh, it's about time that some stuff started getting spread around instead of everything at Central. We do have other high schools too. So I am glad that they want to do some things at West High School. Uh, I think they greatly need that and to get them out of the basement. So I would uh, wholeheartedly support that. Director Foster. And my concern when bringing this up is I don't want to prolong this and delay it because we were told at one of the meetings that this possibly could all be completed by fall of 2024. And so, you know, I definitely want to see something happen and in place by 2024 or no, 2023. And um, so I don't want to de delay it, but I also look at here's $11 million that we'll have to spend on the project or by eliminating the why, can we do the whole project for $2 million? And so I don't, as a board, I don't want us to be foolish on how we're spending the taxpayer dollars. And I, my, my other concern too, and after talking to Josh and, and Superintendent Snakeloff, as far as this fee of uh, constru construction costs for the architects. And you look at it and you think, okay, 6%, okay, fine. But you know, 6% 6 of $11 million is $660,000, okay? Um, if that's the going rate, I guess that's the going rate, but 
this is not like you're building classrooms. This is just one big shell, uh, very few dividing walls. Um, so I don't know. To me, it still sounds uh, uh, really high. But again, just reiterating what I'm said before is let let's just make sure we're being very wise on how we're spending the taxpayers dollars director Barrett. um i know i've brought this up before i think probably right after mr josh got here mr Mansky got here was the surprising price of these uh <laughs> architects um and that five percent six percent was kind of the going rate um i did have a question though about the proposal it says that there are direct owner expenses um the environmental analysis and abatement boundary and or topographic survey soil borings and municipality utility and other impact fees does that mean we are responsible for those those are not something that ar the architects would do yes and they're only done if they're needed so we wouldn't want that added in there as an additional cost on top of the other um, estimate. It, it would just inflate the architectural costs even more. So they separate out particular items knowing that I can call a contractor down the road and have them do that for me without having to pay an architect to down to do it basically. Okay. So would this come then to us as a change fee or would it be a separate contract because it would be something that somebody identified that we needed to uh, I think it would be a separate contract. I don't think it would be a change order. Okay. Director Parson. One more thing, and then I'll shut up. Um, say we get to 2029, uh, the Y is, that lost a lot of membership, and they decide they don't want to be uh, involved with that anymore. So we build this new gym, and now we'll have an additional two more gyms. I'm, I'm sure we, we'll make, you know, good use of it. But then, you know, hindsight's always twenty twenty. Did we need to spend that $11 million? Okay. Dr. Gordon. Um, for the weight room, is that just to build? an additional weight room or does that cost include the equipment that needs to go into the weight room? That would be just to build the weight room. I don't believe it includes equipment. Because gym equipment's real expensive. <laughs> yeah, I think in, we have one estimate. In terms much. of our equipment, the, the, the equipment we have down there is actually working really well for our students. Is that accurate? And, and we've already purchased um, the additional equipment, I think it was a year ago. Is that accurate, Willie? Uh, no, that is actually a part of that Friday update that I sent about a month or so ago talking about uh, us beginning to bid that, pro not bid, uh, do an RFP for uh, equipment at all three high schools uh, because we're coming to a point where all three high schools are going to need equipment. So regardless of building, we have the equipment need that's out there for all three high schools. And the equipment that they're currently utilizing would go up would just be moved up. Um, and then another thing I was thinking, and this is just kind of spitballing ideas, kind of piggybacking off the things that Kent was saying. Um, if we were able to utilize the Y space, you know, continuing the partnership with them, but in order to maybe not have to spend all this money, um, could we look at the way that uh, gym and weight classes are scheduled and maybe work out something where like Tuesday, Thursdays, gym classes can use the weight room and the gym and, you know, Monday, Wednesdays, the why people get it full day or certain hours of the day or something just to make it work out better for the district so that we're getting our money's worth out of what we put into that partnership if that wasn't an equal initial investment. Anyone else have anything more to add? Superintendent Snack. Madam Vice President. Yes, sir. Go ahead. Hey, Josh, uh, if we go through this project and everything and with the architect cost, we will own the prints, right? It's not going to be that the 
architect owns the prints and if we want to do something later on we have to uh pay them again for the prints for our project that is correct i love that question well because in past practice we've never owned them so i wanted to make sure yes okay um and then on the other thing uh with the architect fees being six percent it's like that all over and the architects actually have to figure out all the structural the load bearing what materials can can and cannot be used um they have to put the schedule of piping duct work uh air handling units and have to factor all that stuff in so i mean there is quite a bit of work there that's just um i do have a construction background so they're my least favorite people on the job site uh uh, because they think everything looks great on a flat piece of paper, but they do do a good job at what they do. Thank you. Yeah, it also includes the engineering services too. So you're right about the piping and, and HVAC stuff. Anyone else? Okay, if there's more information that you're needing on this, please see Superintendent Schneckloff and maybe get with he and Josh so you can get all the information that you need in order to make an informed decision when it's time to vote on this. Okay, moving on to purchase of online learning platform, Ingenuity. So the Davenport Schools, we put together a, um, off the feedback that the school board has given us, um, some criteria for accessing online. Our students are applying and we feel that there is still a need for some online services in Davenport. We went from, I would say 1100 students last year to now we're under a hundred. Is, is that no, just like slightly, slightly well, I'll turn it over to you in just a second, Mr. Driscoll and uh, Courtney. So this is this, this is a continuation of the contract from last year where we, we are recommending that we utilize the AEA and, and their teaching staff to provide this. So I'll turn it over to a Ben and Courtney to kind of kind of talk through the, the talking points. So um, online learning will have a home in uh, through mid city it will be supervised by the mid city principal. Um, so we, we have a person and administrator overseeing the whole program within the schools. Um, that doesn't mean that the students are now mid city students, but it just, it, it's the, um, a centralized point. Currently we have, and I, this is as of an hour and a half ago, two hours ago, we have 11 students total K through five that have requested to be online. Uh, we have 17 between sixth and eighth grade. And then we have 86 high school students for 114, but pretty close superintendent Schneck class. So we're at 114 right now. Um, I know that one question that the board has had in the past is if it is not an effective platform. So we did create a criteria through a lot of conversation with principals and our online learning coordinators and the student support liaisons that were supporting them. Um, and so the established criteria was uh, passing all your online learning classes that you've taken in the past and maintaining uh, attendance above that 90% online attendance. Um, if any student did not meet that criteria, uh, then they were, they were told uh, that you have not met the criteria established by the school district. And then there was an appeal process where they could then appeal. Uh, that was coordinated by that Mid-City principal, Principal Seifert. And um, from there, she and a director uh, uh, or an ILD from the region, uh, along with the homeschool building principal, would get, would get on and, and, and read the rationale and consider it. I'll give you an example of one that might be considered. Maybe a student face-to-face -face two years ago actually got all Ds and Fs and online learning. They got all Bs and Cs in one D, so it was really a better platform for that student. We'll buy our criteria alone that student wouldn't qualify. So then when they appealed and said, actually, we're really making progress, then they would be considered. So we weren't so black and white that we just absolutely not, um, but it was a starting point, and that's how we ended at that 114. Any questions that would help? Um, did we lose anybody, like, completely in this process of, you know, 
saying, well, you didn't meet the attendance requirements or something like that. And then they just didn't bother to appeal and they just. Uh, it, it, then they open a role to a different school district altogether. Is that what you're Or asking? something like that. Yeah. Um, I am not aware of any, but I can't, okay. I can't say for sure that. Because the be. default then would be if they didn't say any, if they didn't appeal, the default would be then they'd be in their face-to-face homeschool unless they chose to go somewhere else. Correct. Because they were already <laughs> enrolled in our schools. So yeah. they were just, so we have them kind of on the books. So they would have had to officially okay, okay. You know, go another direction. Um, so they're online and what's the role of the mid city principal since she does not have control of any of the teachers because they're all AEA teachers. So, uh, things like, um, what's the orientation? Uh, how do I, who do I call when I, when I need to know how to, how to reach out to edgenuity? Uh, where, where does this appeal go to? So. For 114 kids divided by 30, now you have 30 different principals trying to handle their three to five kids, and the message becomes um, disconjoined, and, and one principal, well intended, may um, have different information than the other. So it just it allows for one centralized place to, this is my roster of kids within this alternative learning center yeah but she doesn't direct any of the AEA staff I mean she can't say to them you need to call this parent or this student because they're not attending or so we do have we will have online learning coordinators and coordinator at AEA or excuse me at mid-city and student support liaisons at mid-city so they she will have staff um, designed to support families and not splitting hairs here we are in a consortium with the AEA to get a uh, to get kind of discounted pricing through Edgenuity, they're Edgenuity teachers, not AEAs. Just, I'm, I'm just for your clarification. So they were Iowa certified teachers, but they actually work for Edgenuity, not for the AEA. So are they considered Iowa teachers? Mm -hmm. Are they getting IPERS and all of that? Oh, I, I don't know that. Yeah, that's an edge question, I suppose. Anyone else? Mm -hmm. A question. Director Potts. Uh, this 350, was it $356,000, we're, we're paying that out of where? General fund? Yes. Sorry. So go on. Yes, sir, for now. So last year, you know, we had 1,000 students, and so the price tag was considerably more. So now that we've established this criteria, we do have this year where, and next year, if we're going to continue to play with ESSER to find it. But once that's done and it goes to general fund, those hundred students will have a very direct impact on our staffing numbers, of course. And so we're we have from now until what is it? 24, 25 school year to get a real solid before it starts coming out of our general fund, a real solid model for this. Do Whether we, that's with do we receive right? full state aid for for these kids because it's this is if I did the math right it's it's about thirty one hundred bucks a kid right that's thirty one twenty two and eighty cents <laughs> a kid um, I don't know how does that compare I, I, it, I don't know how that compares to the thirteen thousand kids we're educating in person but it just it seems seems like a lot of money for 114 kids. And do we have any other ancillary char costs? So we, is this the whole total bill or you talk about some administrator and there's, is there a secretary involved? Is there, obviously there's no transportation, <laughs> but I mean, is technology. Yeah. Are I any of our, so there's costs above this. Can, is that just, is that itemized anywhere? So, Currently. I guess what, I, what I'm saying is it is it conceivable that our cost per pupil to do online exceeds what we are received from the state and then we, we'd be better off saying I hear the question and is it conceivable I suppose if we weren't conscious of the fact it is possible now currently what Kevin I lean on you our per pupil 
in the state of Iowa is approximately? Our per pupil is approximately 7,400 and something. We're going to be generating a little over $800,000 on these kids. We are. This is a little bit less than half just on the ingenuity piece. We won't be spending the other half on all the stuff talking about Bruce. Um, we'll be spending some. We'll have some staff, but not near to that difference. So we'll be coming out not overspending what these students uh, generate. Director so Potts. Piggy, so to piggyback off what Ben's saying, the two the, the years that we have to figure out is exactly the dollars that these students generate, what does that programming look like? And then we are going to start setting our own parameters on how to staff that, it's very similar to the old open enrollment dates mm -hmm. and things like that, to make sure that they're not costing us 10 grand more. And if they're, if they're because we, 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 this is something we're constantly monitoring to make sure that it's not costing us more dollars. Um, now, the, the, the cost of their Chromebook and things of that nature, that, that would be a, a great information and it would be good for us to itemize the other, the other things on there. But the cost of um, the student success liaisons, the, the people that are kind of managing their, their caseload managers online, those dollars would be offset by the other portion that Kevin's talking about. And so it's, it fluctuates so much because of COVID. We, we don't have a, a, a okay, in the last five years, this is what this has cost us. So we really only have two predictable years to figure it out this year and next year. I believe our system, uh, of, of, I'm very proud of the system they put together to determine whether or not online works for you. And if they don't want to do that, they do go to Iowa online and they do go to other school districts that offer that and open enroll right now. So if we didn't have this program, it would be all of those students would be in another school district right now. Would Our open enrollment numbers up would be up from that. So the dollars that... Or they decide to come to school. Or they would decide to come to school. Yes, they would. Do, do we do any... Um, do these students involved... The, I'm sorry, not the ones that are drop in, drop out. Okay, because I'm assuming there are some that drop in and drop out. They drop in and they drop out, right? But those that are permanent in, is there any way we monitor their progress that they're actually learning? So um, that is what the student support liaison and online learning coordinator will be designed to do in addition to the teachers that we are paying for, but they aren't our teachers and we don't communicate with them as much. So that's why we have that staff there as well. Okay. I had some of the same questions that, that Bruce had. Now, when you talk about the liaison, is that, is that person, is that included in this 356,000? So that's be an additional cost then. Okay. Um, Kevin, when we, we have, when we have to phase out of the ESSER funds and we have to have it on our, in our out of our general fund, how, how are we going to manage that and not dig ourselves a hole after a while? What, we'll, what we will do is we will have a separate account set up for online learning, just like we would for a building. So we would associate people or parts of people that are dedicated to online learning and move their salaries into that. So you can see exactly how much each student generates, but you also see how much the exact program costs. Um, so if a three SSLs are assigned to here, all three of those SSLs will be charged to that account. And so we'll be able to, to tell what the cost to that program is exactly. So we'll have a separate line item for that, for that only then? Correct. Okay. And so you think that, do you think that from a financial standpoint, that is going to be feasible? Yes. Okay. The, the other concern I have is for some of these students, I'm not sure if we're doing them any favors. Uh, from just a social aspect, um, when kids aren't involved with classmates, I just I'm concerned that we're do doing them a disservice. Um, I understand, uh, Superintendent Schnakeloff, what you're saying as far as they can. If we don't provide it, they can go to the Iowa online learning. Um, 
are we are we just doing this i guess we are we're we're doing this for the dollars coming from the state basically then well i think i think this board charged the administration with finding what do we believe in and so the team put together okay you have you have to have good attendance you have to be earning credits you have to have to have a bunch some have tos and we can live with that so if you choose to apply online it's not working for you we want you to come back and you choose to open and roll out that's what we can live with because it's it's been obvious that you're not successful online you need to come back and so to kind of find the balance of that we because we believe the same thing um and some students are very successful online for for many different reasons um, so that's that's kind of how we decided to strike that balance with that when our when our legislators uh voted to make us more competitive this is one of the byproducts of it we have to be competitive with the some of our students need this and i and i'm, I'm not I, you're going to ask me what's the best form of education it's face to face with a teacher in a building live 100 percent all day long and i think this is a byproduct of that and i applaud our board for for pushing this district to put together to put in place rules and regulations that we can stand by saying yes this is what we believe in ben did you have anything you wanted to add to that uh, the only thing i was going to say director question is uh, I don't think this is just a dollars and cents um, in my experience with the people that have been applying, um, whether or not we necessarily agree with it. There are families that are saying my child anxiety. I mean, there are a lot of reasons that a family is choosing to do this. And um, I guess I don't feel qualified to make a, a parenting decision for 14,000 students. My my concern is is just you know when these when these kids get out in the real world, you know how are they going to cope in the real world if they are not, you know, involved with other students? But you know, I totally understand where you're coming from as far as you know providing a need and that. One thing I guess I would like to see if if some of the people um, salaries are not included. Uh, in this 356,000, I would like to see a bottom line figure that says, okay, this is what it's going to cost us. When you take into consideration all staff and everything, I want to know what the um, bottom do line dollar is. And Director Kondra. Um, Could you explain what our switching policy is? I mean, yeah. when can they go in? When they can they come out? Mm -hmm. So... No more going in this year unless there's an appeal in that's being addressed right now. Until second semester, we're going to give one opportunity to flip flop. Um, and that was done with input, like I said, from stakeholders in the buildings. Like, when is the right time to come back and forth? And after a lot of deliberation on the pros and cons, we landed on we will allow for one opportunity. They have to give us plenty of notice so they can finish up their coursework. You know, the majority are secondary kids. We want them to get their credits and then if they needed to flip, but it's just a one-time opportunity. Correct. Now, yes. What I stopped myself from saying, um, Director Clendrome, was there are cases through the appeal where it was like, man, this is dicey, but you are the parent. So what we're going to do is kind of a probationary. We're going to watch. And if you're falling off, we're going to have you come back. Because we don't want to say, well, three months from now. So so that's why I hesitate when you said either way, because if the school really wants to pull them back, we're going to we're going to want to pull the trigger on that sooner. But as far as a change window, just once halfway through the year. President Gosa, did you have anything to add? Um, I just wanted to say I think it's. it's uh, Awesome that you guys were able to put something together on this. Um, you are trying to meet students' needs. Uh, not every student's cut out to be in a classroom, just like not every student's cut out to go to college. Um, and I'm glad we're starting to break those mindsets. Um, some kids are going to be more successful that way. Some are not. I'm glad there's things put in place to uh, kind of monitor that. 
Um, just families have different needs, and I'm glad we're able to kind of meet that. Uh, their kids could be involved in competitive things that this is a perfect opportunity for them to still get an education while pursuing their dreams and stuff. Um, but I do want to uh, thank you all for putting the work into this. And uh, I agree with Director Potch, and I'd like to see what the bottom dollar cost is on everything. Um, but otherwise, uh, I definitely support this. Thank you. Just for um, clarification, Mr. Driscoll, the, there's already been the cutoff for this coming school year, so no more students are subject to be added. Correct. The uh, cutoff was actually a month or so ago, and then the the only ones we're addressing are the appeals, and it's on an individual one on one with the building principals, the ILD, and the and the family. So yeah. Okay. Thank you. And as I said earlier, if there's any additional information that you're needing for clarification on this, please check with Superintendent Snickloff so you can get your answer prior to the vote. Moving on to item 11.04, ISB bylaws, amendments, and the choice of the delegates. Yeah, I... I can speak to this. Um, this item came up at the delegate at the assembly last year uh, with some conversation and was narrowly defeated. Uh, since that time, as you've read through here, additional information has come to light upon the national organization. Its financial status is shaky. Its um, its service responsive responsiveness has decreased, and the dues are sixty eight thousand dollars a year. The amendment that they're talking about here simply changes the wording in the bylaws of the Iowa School Board Association from it being mandatory to join the, this, this, this particular, several national organizations, this particular national organization, to saying it is voluntary. They, the, the board of directors can choose to join. Okay, so it's simply making it permissive as opposed to mandatory. Um, the last time around, I just, you know, I voted in favor of the amendment uh, to make it permissive that they give the, the board of directors discretion to decide if they want to join this national organization or another national organization. Director Beck. So what we are, if we send a delegate, when we send a delegate to this, what the vote is on is just the language of making it optional to be a member of the mm -hmm. NSBA. But there's some other information in there about a different association that the IASB plans mm -hmm. to join. This, that would be a separate. That would be a different kettle of fish. I mean, that we're not voting on that. The September, the September 23rd meeting. It's 13th, I think. Is simply to make joining a national organization discretionary on the part of the board of directors of the Iowa School Board Association. Okay. They have, in, uh, in additional information here, they've talked about that second organization and they provided information on what states have associated themselves with that other organization right. and what states are still with the older organization. Yeah. Would you be willing to be the delegate? Yes. Okay. Madam Vice President. I was just getting ready to call on you. I would like to, uh, when we got to take action on this, move for Director Potts to be our, our delegate. But I would also move for Director Potts to be our delegate at the delegate assembly in November so we can do it all in one motion. If he's willing. Yeah. I'll... Okay. It's the highlight of my life. <laughs> I actually figured out how to vote on my phone the last time. Yeah, it was. Any additional discussion on that? Just for an informal poll around the room. Are you okay with that, Director Kleindrum? Director Poston? Director Beck? Director Gordon? And I, too, am in favor of that as well. Thank you. Any additional discussion on this? All right.
11.05, Director Beck. Um, this is the second discussion on all of the policies you see before you. Are there any comments or questions? If so, please bring them forward now. Otherwise, we will be voting on these at our next regular meeting. Director Gordon. Um, yeah, policy 307, um, the communication channels for complaints. I know that I've mentioned this um, before. I, for the most part, agree with the communication channels. However, I do feel like there are some instances where this is not in the best interest of um, the transparency of the district. So being a former employee, I've seen firsthand that uh, it's not always feasible for people at the teacher, para, support staff level to get their concerns heard. And if that communication channel is to go first to their principal, a lot of times that won't happen for several reasons. One, the principal is in meetings a lot of the time or dealing with behavior concerns. They're just not always available for what teachers feel are serious things, but the principal may not feel that way. Also, the principal is in a position where they often feel they need to impress their ILD or their superintendent and their chain of command, and so they won't, they won't bring what they feel are petty concerns. They'll say, nope, it's fine, just keep doing what you're doing. Um, and there have been, in past years, in present years, um, concerns about, I don't want to say like alliances because that sounds kind of reductive, I guess, but um, friendly relationships between principals and their ILDs, which then prevents serious concerns from skipping, like from going through the entire pathway, from getting further on from getting um, resolved at the levels that they could be getting resolved at because they, you know, people know that their chain of command is principal first and then if the principal doesn't do it, then go to the ILD. Well, I've heard over and over, I can't go to my ILD, they're buddy-buddy with our principal. Um, and that's a problem to me. There needs to be some kind of channel where teachers and support staff can get their concerns, their very valid concerns, heard um, and, and handled without feeling like they're going to be retaliated against. It's that same reason why we don't have a lot of staff members come and talk at board meetings or send us emails with their names attached because that's a real concern. There is real retaliation that happens at the building level. And I hate to say that, I don't like that, but I want it to change, which is why I'm bringing that up. And that is my concern with the, the language of this policy. And I understand that you know ISA, um, ISB requires has a policy similar or whatever, and we have to follow that for code. Um, but I would, I would like to see it modified in in some way so that the staff that is doing the most work at the building level with the students um, has that channel to get their problems solved. Especially as we're seeing so many staff leaving, not just our district, but you know, nationwide. So that that's all. Okay, so this, um, as I read it, this is largely for non-staff, so parents and community members, right, um, <clears throat> versus staff. And I do know that we generally want people to follow these patterns so they're not immediately, you know, going up here. But I understand your concerns. Would it be... Um, maybe would you be amenable to making sure that this is named for the public or for, you know, and then having something separate for staff in, instead? I mean, I would. you know, because really as it's written, this is generally parents and other members of the school district community. It, it doesn't directly apply to teachers and staff themselves. Um, so, you know, I could see making a case for having a separate, you know, mode of communication for, for that. 
Um, um, it does say in number five, it says, you know, it's with, if it's not resolved, steps one through four within the discretion of the board to address complaints from the members of the school district community. So that, to me, says that this policy, I, I realize that the first sentence doesn't make it sound that way, but number five does make it sound that way. Okay. So I would be amenable to two separate policies where we could lay that out separately or, or rewording something, but as written, I, I think it's too rigid. Okay. Director Potts, you looked like you had something to say. I did, um, <clears throat> two thoughts. One, we have procedures in place that we provide staff when it comes to harassment and, and, and a variety of other workplace instances. And I'm wondering if we don't have something in administrative regulations that may address some of these other concerns. I don't know that. Yes, there there is on the website. It's called grievance procedure. So it gives you the steps of starting. First, you always want to try and uh, resolve the situation at the lowest level possible. Um, but there's a 401.47a admin reg on the grievance procedure. And then it does go into the escalation process because um, that's part of my department as well as the equity there is an online complaint form people don't always feel comfortable going to their principal so they do come and submit a formal complaint form that way so maybe what we can do is put in language that says uh, for staff the and provide a cross-reference to that policy with the online complaint form Jamie does that you said it's it's 407 401.47 a and then the procedures also out on the website yeah. under equity so maybe if we put in language in this policy that cross-references that for staff right yeah it's listed down there but maybe a sentence that says employee complaints refer to something else uh director klein jerome you look like you are about to say something um, I, I think my battery's done um i don't see though a complaint as the same thing as a grievance because a grievance in my world was if you violated the contract then there is a way to you know step through it if I have a complaint, that isn't necessarily going against the contract, um, so I'm not sure that. I think that this title on here should be changed because it is a complaint process. The grievance procedures are set forth in each of the individual collective bargaining agreements. So I think this naming convention is old, so I do think that that's something that should be changed. Because you are grievance correct. should be in the title of this. No, grievance should not because a grievance oh. procedure is set forth in the collective bargaining agreements. Right. You're correct. So it shouldn't be tied together. Um, and the other thing is, I I think in that first line, it does address, you know, that are concerned to parents and other members of the school district community. So they are saying this is this is the path you follow if you're a school school district employee. Um, I, as in a grievance though, if it, it affects lots of people, I don't have to start at my principal. I can jump way ahead. And I, I think maybe that needs to be included that if it, this isn't just concerning me, it's like lots of people, uh, there's a way to jump over some of these steps. And I think that could be incorporated in there. So should the policy committee then revisit this at the next Wednesday at the policy committee meeting maybe and figure out what the best way to go about whether we need a separate policy for everybody who's not an employee versus people who are employees. I mean, I'm sensitive to the concern. I totally understand. Um, there it's a, it's a tough thing to say because you do want general procedures and you want people to follow those general procedures, but you want them to know if they aren't comfortable with that, that there is an option. So um, maybe, Jamie, are you available to attend on Wednesday? I won't be there, but 
I'm sure you guys can handle it without me. Okay, um, so we'll bring that one back to the policy committee then. And 307, okay. Anything else? Yeah, go ahead. So is the general concern that if something nefarious is going on between buddies and a complaint's not being heard, what's my step to go above those people, essentially? Because I need to be heard, right? Okay. I also don't think the like jumping a step. I, I would I would not like it if you pass the principal up, and he had no idea he or she had no idea what your complaint was, and you just went to the next level. So I think they really need to address it. And if you you don't take care of my complaint, then I go to the next step, and I you know I don't have to say the principal. Well, I'm going to the next step. You just, but I did the right thing by going to them first so that they know. This is a problem. Now, if they do nothing about it, okay, then I go to the next person. Don't do anything, go to the next person. But don't blindside people and they, like, I didn't know this was an issue or a problem. So. Yeah, I can see that as well because they may not know there's a problem or that the person's not comfortable talking to them if you skip over that level. Yeah. All right, well, let's send it to the policy committee and see if we can't come up with a way to word it to uh, make sure that people understand that what we're trying to say here, if that's okay with you guys. Okay. All right. Director Gordon, you okay with that? Okay. Any questions on any of the other policies that are here? Director Postu? Um, policy 306, uh, succession of authority to the superintendent. Um, Superintendent Snakeoff, are, are you comfortable with this? Uh, when I read, uh, the board will appoint an acting superintendent to assume the responsibilities of the superintendent. Do you, is that what you really want or should there be something specifically in place for that? So <clears throat> this would, this policy to me is in, um, an absence of a long-term absence um, so in, in an issue that we have seen in the past. And I, I believe that states that that is exactly what's occurred in the past. If I am sick for a, a couple of days, a couple of months, we have a system that's worked out. Um, and, and as you saw when I was on vacation last couple of Mondays ago, um, Jamie, stepped in and, and did that really well. If it becomes uh, longer than that, then that, then I, and, and it becomes probably something that's semi-permanent, um, then I would say that the board would, would do that. So I am comfortable with this. I think our administrative, what, what the school board has been asking me for is an, an administrative regulation around this. And so what we've arrived at is that we would rotate that between our cabinet members. Um, the, the 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 school board recognized that our cabinet and want, and wants the, our cabinet to have equal authority there's a reason for the way they're paid the way they're structured things of that nature and so identifying a clear structure between that also would increase responsibilities and things of that nature so it would alter our structure so we have um a a, a basically a rotating basis so if i'm gone who's available who's willing to do it are there certain things coming up in that week so that's what we have worked out as a cabinet and so this i believe is a safe a safe fail in case i you know i don't want to talk about some of those reasons like i go to the hospital for a month again um, that would be something that we would work out internally as a cabinet um, and then this would be more of those long time instances that we actually faced in the last three years. So yes, I am comfortable with that. It's different than if I'm gone for a week. Does that help? Yeah, it sounds like you're okay with it. I'm just thinking from as from a board member standpoint, so this situation comes up, how how are we as a board going to vote on this? I mean, how are we, I mean, are we going to nominate people and you know what what's what's the process going to be um to me i'd like to see something more 
something more cast in stone, but you know, I I can go either way. My brother. Well, in the past, the, there's been one time where we've done what I've been on the board is that the board gets together and we have a conversation and we select somebody to act as the acting superintendent, and you reach consensus. And at that, at this point where this um, is enacted, this is very awkward for me to talk about, by the way. When this is enacted, the attorneys will be heavily involved in ensuring the board is, is boxed up. <laughs> Which we're not. <laughs> <laughs> I think Jamie's already, you know, got it since she took over. So, it's your. Yeah, um, but but what Director Potts said did, has happened in the past because um, by law, to be a superintendent, you have to have a superintendency, and so the board can call a special meeting. The president would get notified. The board would call a special meeting and find out who's qualified to to fill in an interim position and we have then voted on it. Um, but, you know, in before that can happen, there may be somebody who needs to run the district and the system that we have in place now seems to be working pretty well. So um, I do understand the concern for, you know, maybe things change in five years, but then the policy can change if necessary. So, all right. <laughs> TJ's done with this one. Um, <laughs> uh, anything else? Oh, Director Gosa, do you have anything? No, I do not. All right, then we will see these again on at our next regular meeting to vote on um, minus 307 because we're taking that back to the policy committee and we may, depending on what comes of that discussion on Wednesday oh sure director Postron. on um, policy 600 goals and objectives a lot of things in here are similar to um, our philosophy can those two be combined? Yes. So this is um, more of a placeholder. It says the series is devoted to goals and objectives. Um, this is more of a, this is a template that came from IASB. They provide two options. We talked about it last time, choosing option one or option two. Um, it does uh, overlap a little bit. Um, we can certainly provide this to tag, tag as part of our discussion of the educational philosophy. Um, the policy committee could certainly discuss whether we even need this policy. That's fine. We can bring that back to the policy committee as well. If the policy committee is okay with that, Director Kleinjerome. Pardon? Okay. All right. Um, then we'll pull that one back and see if it's one we even need because we definitely don't want to have policies that are repetitive or not necessary. So anything else? And I'll make sure TAG gets a copy of this 600. Okay. Now we're done. Thank you, Director Beck. Administrative reports? None at this time. Board reports? Board requests, I'm sorry. Okay, reflections. Let's start with President Gosa. Um, I didn't get to hear the first bit of the meeting, so I missed the presentation. So my highlight of the night was uh, Director Potts' education us on the ISB stuff. So thank you for that, Bruce. That's all I got. 
Okay, Director Gordon. <laughs> Director Gordon. I did really enjoy the presentation from the Wildwood, um, Camp Wildwood. I had never heard of that before, so that's very cool. But I also wanted to reflect on how cool I think it is how um, we all come together to like make good decisions and make hard decisions. You know, when we have differing opinions on things, we're able to talk them through and, and come together on something that makes sense. So I really value that. Dr. Potts. I think the reflection is how how uneventful the meeting was in terms of, you know, we, we just, we did our work. We did our job. We, we discussed what we were supposed to discuss. We were succinct. And we moved on, and I think that's that's just a mark to how we we've created a functional, balanced operation as a board. Dr. Um, I, I agree. I think we're having good discussion. We don't just like okay slide it past us. We, you know, express our opinions. We get to some in depth discussion on all these topics that. Are important to the district. Dr. Parson. <clears throat> I agree with the last two. Director Beck. Um, that was the fastest, most productive mission statement production I have ever seen. So thank you to TAG and thank you to the board for, it took us what, two workshops and that was it. And that is, I think, fantastic. And nobody blew their top over the placement of a comma or a period. So awesome. And then all the other stuff too. <laughs> I echo everything that's been said. Um, in front of the meetings, people are calling, asking questions, sending emails. That's very valuable. Um, and I see the communication um, that is occurring at the board table is very valuable. Um, I also see a cadence that's occurring. You know, we're, we're establishing our priorities. We're sending those priorities on. We're, we're getting in the rhythm of going to our conferences and being prepared for them. And that's incredibly important. Okay, again, I echo everything that's been said. And one thing that I would really like to emphasize is our action items. I really appreciate our new structure where we go through all of the items where when it's time to vote on them, we can just kind of jump right through them without a whole lot of additional discussion. Whereas we've had that time to hear the presentation, we've had that time to follow through with superintendent and various cabinet meetings or members to get the answer that's required to not ponder through them when they come up on for a vote and we can just kind of go through them. So it may seem like we're rushing through them, but it's been some time that's put into the answers in order to come to an agreement that we can vote on. And I just thank everyone for taking that serious and going through and getting the information that's needed for the vote. With that, Director Potts. So move. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. We call this meeting to a close. Thank you.